Um, obviously, with the mandate report that came out last week, there's a lot of discussion. There's going to be a lot of buzz here at um, RSA. Most of the attention is really forensic in nature. How do we discover APTs? How do we know if they've hacked us? How do we kick them off our network and keep them off? Um, this panel, I think, is really about denying opportunity to uh, sophisticated attackers, protecting critical assets, and, and doing it with strong you know, hardware-based uh, security solutions. So without uh, further ado, because we, we're, uh, we're short on time, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then I'm actually going to go around and give them each an opportunity to, um, to introduce themselves and, and just say a little bit about what we do. On my left, um, we have uh, Frank Molesbury, who is from the, uh, the lead security technologist uh, in Dell's office of of the Chief Technology Officer. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paul. As I said, I'm a, the uh, security lead in our end user computing CTO office, so basically all of our uh, endpoints, desktops, notebooks, tablets, et cetera. I'm also our primary rep to TCG and have been doing that for, I don't know, the last seven, eight years. Thanks, Frank. Uh, to Frank's left, Stacy Kennedy. I'm a Chief Security Scientist for Digital Management. Digital, digital Management focuses on mobile solutions, and I am part of the group that makes sure those solutions are secure. I sit on, I represent DMI on the board of directors for TCG and I'm active in several of the work groups. And to Stacy's left, we have uh, Sunil Gutumuka, sorry, Gutumukala, <laughs> uh, sorry. And uh, Sunil is a, a principal program manager at Microsoft. Hi, I'm Sunil Gutumukala. I lead a team of program managers at Microsoft and our team is responsible for platform integrity and access and isolation within Windows. So um, basically all of the platform integrity solutions for the Windows client and Windows Server is uh, coming out of my team. And to Sunil's up, Bob, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Bob Thibodeau. Um, day to day, I don't know what I do, but uh, <laughs> over the long term. So I'm the guy who brought you the Opal, or the whole SED technology uh, developed. I was chief technologist at Seagate. Uh, and. Uh, now I'm with Wave, which is the largest producer of the software for the hardware that we've built, and also the uh, 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 TPMs and so forth and so on. Uh, and so that's sort of what I do today. I'm chief, chief I'm a senior VP and uh, chief scientist for Wave now. Thank you. Um, we are going to have uh, time for questions at the end, so, uh, and there, I think there are mics in the room, so if you've got questions, we're, we're watching the time carefully and we're going to leave some time, uh, so think of them, write them down, hold on to them, and we'll get to them at the end. I think uh, just to sort of jump into the meat of this conversation, APT is right there in the, in the headline, uh, in the title of the panel. Um, help us connect the dots a little bit, um, and I'm going to start with Bob, on uh, the, the advanced persistent threat sophisticated attacks, whatever you want to call it. Um, what, is, what is the relevance of uh, uh, both technologies like Trusted Platform uh, Module, TPM chips, and the TCG standards, uh, Trusted Network Connect, IFMAP, to uh, that particular problem that we're hearing a lot about? So um, I'm going to give a, a one minute uh, thing on the advanced persistent threat history a little bit. Uh, <laughs> You don't have a minute, Bob. Uh, 100,000 <laughs> IBM PCs were bricked back in 1997. The advanced persistent threat stuff has, has been around a long time. When you all hear about uh, a word called Trojan, that's typically, that was an early form of advanced persistent threat that still goes on today. When you get a phishing attack, you may get a Trojan on your machine. And what happens with most Trojans most of the time Okay. is they do the same thing as jailbreaking an iPhone. So there's a, in a jailbreaking an iPhone, there's a second level boot, which is the equivalent of a master boot record boot, okay, or an NT loader, uh, for those of you all who are familiar with this. But it, it happens before the OS is booted, you put some code in there. Okay. That's what a Trojan does. When you get a phishing attack, It'll try to get something to happen in the code on the next boot of the machine. That code that's pre-boot code will then proceed to change the operating system before the operating system has a chance to run. And it will guarantee that change on every next boot of the machine, so it's persistent forever. 
It is a complete compromise of your device, just like jailbreaking and rooting a machine is a complete compromise of your device. And nothing in the, if the code is good, nothing in the OS has any knowledge that it's been compromised because the OS itself was changed. So this is the worst possible thing to happen. Okay. If you all study the uh, vectors of this stuff, uh, uh, NSA has, has stated that uh, this kind of a compromise has two results possible. One result is a total compromise of your OS, a total compromise, including, so these things are also called kernel viruses, okay? The second one is you can completely brick the device. You can destroy the device so that it will never boot again, okay? So those are the two things that you can get through these Trojans, and, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of y'all have actually experienced uh, these things actually going off that, that, that give you the total compromise. Uh, all jailbroken iPhones do this. All rooted Androids uh, do this, use the same technique for your benefit as opposed to some bad guys. The TPM was designed from day one to stop that kind of attack. Okay? And it does that by measuring the pre-boot environment in hardware, in other words, providing a, a mechanism for measuring the pre-boot environment, and then feeding forward the fact that you've been compromised to a later process. That feed forward is done in a way that um, can't be manipulated by the pre-boot virus, by the pre-boot Trojan. Okay. So the TPM was designed from scratch to handle this most worst case of all worst cases it's also one of the most common forms of attack out there uh, in the world. Stuxnet, for example, there were two pre-boot Trojans injected. Right. And um, so just, sorry, so Sunil, I know Microsoft has been one of the companies that's done the most really to address uh, some of the secure boot issues uh, going with BitLocker and, and going forward now with Windows 7 and 8 with, with TPM as well. Talk to us a little bit about, um, first of all, kind of what, what folks who might be migrating to Windows 8 now, what features are in there that they can take advantage of, and, and also how to sort of manage this in a heterogeneous environment where maybe you've got some uh, Windows 8 systems as well as Windows 7 and older legacy systems. Sure. <clears throat> so along the lines that Bob mentioned, and, and the standard that's topic of our uh, panel discussion today, Windows 8 basically has a uh, we made a new investment uh, uh, in the feature called Secure Boot to basically protect against the BIOS level malware that Bob talked about. Um, basically, what it does is you know, it's different from PCAT BIOS that we have pre Windows 8 environment. So, in Windows 8, whenever there is a machine that's booting up, the UFI based uh, firmware system validates that the firmware itself hasn't been compromised, and then it's going to validate the OS loader that's going to load. So basically ensuring that it's integrity protected. And then it has protections against rollback, in, uh, rollback attacks and that kind of stuff. So that's a major investment that we have, major investment that we've done with uh, Secure Boot. In addition, um, there is a complementary uh, feature that we added. It's called early launch of anti-malware. What it does is, when, if there is a BIOS level malware, any antivirus software or anti-malware software has no chance of fighting against it because it's sitting below the OS. So what we've done in Windows 8 is we, ha we take advantage of the secure boot, so we have the root of trust all the way from the BIOS to the loading of the operating system itself. And with ELAM, we ensure that no other third-party driver gets loaded before the AM early launch uh, ELAM driver gets loaded. So AM is the first third party driver that gets loaded so that um, AV software has a fighting chance against any kind of advanced persistent uh, threats it may come across. So okay. That, okay. So, uh, and, and, and the second part, how for folks in the audience, what is an easy, I mean, the technology is there, the next, the, the next piece of the puzzle is adoption, implementation. Uh, and, and just kind of weaving these into your IT infrastructure. Um, maybe turf it to you, Robert. I mean, how do you, what's an easy way to do that? 
Well, from an implementation perspective, one is to sit back and say from an from a enablement of base TPMs, right? Uh, Dell and other OEMs, we've been shipping trusted platform modules in our systems for years and years, right? And we're now seeing an uptick in adoption of those, not only with self-encrypted drives, with secure boot in Windows 8, uh, but with some of the, the, the NIST protected standards, right, uh, as well. Uh, in addition to uh, our own products, right, we have our own uh, Dell uh, data protection encryption product that utilizes the TPM to secure mm -hmm. the encryption keys and stuff like that. And, and I think the, 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 the message here is, as we look at solving this sort of APT problem, the whole industry is trying to move the security and measurements of the system sooner and so earlier and earlier in the process, and the TPM is the perfect vehicle for both uh, measuring, storing, and securing those measurements and, and passing them forward. Frank, there are a lot of, uh, you know, on the RSA floor, there are going to be hundreds of different vendors offering uh, uh, d solutions. Is there an easy way to tell which of them are, are going to be leveraging uh, technologies like TPM and, and, and which aren't? Well, I think it's, a, it's, it's one of the primary questions you need to ask each of the vendors, right, is um, are they utilizing uh, trusted computing group technologies, not just for securing data, but for network infrastructure, uh, et cetera, right, and, and what aspects of those products are doing it, and if not, when they plan on rolling that stuff in. Okay. And Stacey, uh, sort of the, the, other, the other topics up for discussion here are, are really around the, the, um, the NIST standards, the evolving NIST standards uh, around secure BIOS and secure boot, uh, hardware-based root of trust uh, for, for devices. Um, what, what does the audience need to know about, you can forgive us all for not following the ins and outs of the whole standard adoption process, but, but where are we with that and, and uh, what, what do folks need to know? All right. So. We've heard that, that BIOS is a target of attack for APTs. Uh, NIST is busy in this regard. They are active in the Trusted Computing Group. They're active in other standards bodies. And they presented their guidance as uh, SP 147 and 155. Uh, we've already heard from the, uh, uh, the CISO of the County of Los Angeles that NIST standards are important. So, these NIST documents, they are guidance. They're not standards. They're not legislation. They're government advice on the best practice, the best way to do things. And once again, we heard from our keynote speaker, pay attention to these best practices. There's a reason why they're the best practice. So uh, we rely on our vendors to provide support for 147 and uh, uh, 155. Mm -hmm. There's a new guidance from NIST called NIST 800-164. It calls for a hardware root of trust present in mobile phones. Once again, we're trying to get at the APT problem that, uh, that Bob mentioned. So, you may, so this has created a certain amount of stress in the industry. That's why I bring it up. There's a tempest in a teapot between uh, NIST and the trade organization of uh, phone OEMs because of misunderstanding words. The NIST document says they want a hardware root of trust. The trade community thinks that means they've got to change their phones and add hardware. This is a misunderstanding. TPMs do exist as physical devices in your laptops and in your desktops, but the specification allows for a TPM to be defined as firmware, assuming that the processor that it runs in can run in a secure operational state. If you have an iPhone or an Android smartphone in your pocket, your device can do that. It's based on an ARM processor that runs Trust Zone. And in fact, if you go back in the corner and visit the Nokia demo, you will see commercial off-the-shelf phones running Win8. They support a TPM as required by Microsoft for that purpose, and they did not change hardware to make that happen. They wrote it as firmware and they run it in the trust zone secure operational state that is a feature of that chip. Right, and by the way, that's all Nokia uh, Windows Phone phones, 100%. You know, I mean, how do you, how do you as an organization that might want to move in this direction, particularly with mobile devices, um, how do you do that uh, given that so many of the trends that are dominating technology adoption within the enterprise are consumer driven and not top down, you know, man managerial uh, driven or IT driven decisions? So, um, like you said, all Nokia phones have this, but of course it's not, off not often at the discretion of the company to say to its employees, we'd prefer if you use a Nokia phone. 
Um, so where, do, where does that leave organizations now, particularly with, again, this sort of growing population of mobile devices that are both work and, and personal devices? Well, some of it isn't just driven bottoms up right in a consumer space. The, the NIST guidelines, while they are guidelines, a lot of times, particularly for anyone out there who, is a, who, who sells hardware or software, oftentimes uh, become a component of of large government or, or large enterprise, uh, you know, bids and stuff like that. So, just like the, uh, the County of Los Angeles looks at NIST standards for their guidance, they turn those into bid requests, right, for the hardware and software they're purchasing. So it becomes a, a enterprise top-down requirement, not just a consumer uh, bottoms-up requirement. Right. So as a professional services company in the mobile space trying to solve these problems, we do the best we can with what we have. It starts with policy. Uh, the corporation is, our customers are going to have to make decisions about where do they want data to reside. Will they allow corporate data to be on the mobile device or will they conserve corporate data on servers that are accessed by mobile devices? On top of that, you do the best you can with the software tools that are available in the market today and you advise the customer to go to their vendors and complain. They want hardware security. And Sunil, I mean, Microsoft's in an interesting position here. You're the world's leading uh, operating system maker, one of the leading software publishers. Uh, and yet, um, you know, with Windows 8, uh, you encourage your OEMs to, to ship these on devices that have TPMs, but, but that's not always the case. It's actually not your call. It's the OEM's call. Correct. So with Windows 8, uh, the secure boot feature that we me uh, I mentioned earlier is actually a logo requirement for all Windows 8 SKUs. That means if you're buying a new Windows 8 PC, you do get the secure boot feature, right? So already you're, in, many, in a sense, leaps and bounds ahead of the earlier um, operating system platform that we have. In addition, when it comes to TPM being a requirement, TPM is a requirement on all Windows RT devices. That means if you're getting a Surface RT device or any of the Surface device or any of the Windows RT devices, it has a TPM um, a firmware implementation of the TPM running on the trust, uh, leveraging trust zone. So, and in addition, on um, all Windows RT devices, the data is um, encrypted using BitLocker, right? So, you so you're um, saying TPM is a requirement on Windows RT, but not, uh, but not on necessarily on Windows 8. So it's not a requirement on all of the Windows 8 desktop PCs, for example. Okay. No, uh, it's an optional component. Uh, but, for example, all of Surface Pro devices come with the TPM by default. All of Intel-based uh, connector standby devices, basically the Intel um, chipsets that give you better, uh, battery life and always on all these connected devices, they have a firmware implementation of the TPM too. So there are lots of devices that have TPM. Uh, obviously, we encourage if you're worried about um, advanced persistent uh, threat in your enterprise, you should have a policy that kind of uh, mandates use of machines that have TPM, right? In addition, <clears throat> so they, uh, we, are, we, are invest, we are leveraging TPM in new scenarios too. We have to say board that doesn't actually directly depend on TPM, but we make sure that if the TPM is present, you know, the enterprises can take advantage of features like virtual smart card. Basically, you can replace smart card by um, using the, your device as the second factor authentication, your TPM is um, used in the protection of the secrets that smart card would uh, protect, right? So you can use that as an um, alternate to the smart card infrastructure. Similarly, we made investments in making sure that TPM is provisioned automatically. So if, if your PC has a TPM, the TPM Windows provisions it automatically and it's available so that it's easier for enterprise admins to kind of deploy BitLocker solutions or any other uh, encryption solutions. Okay, so if it's got the TPM chip and Windows 8 will recognize that and, and enable yeah. it provision automatically, that's not something you need yeah. to know. Exactly. Okay, uh, I, want to, I do want to open, open the discussion to some questions because we're getting near the end of our session um, and I think there are <laughs> folks in the audience with microphones or there are microphones to go to, which there's a question right there. I think you need to go to the mountain rather than the mountain coming to you. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Henry Tang from Next Wave. My question relates to the measurement of uh, TPM. Uh, basically, in the past, 
the uh, industry or DOD had this thing called the Orange Book, right? So it has A1, A2, B1, B2, and so on and so forth. How does the TPM measure against the Orange Book? And let's forget about the government certification process. Just from a technology perspective, where does it fit or measure up to the Orange Book criteria? Well, you can certainly, you can certainly have a, a highly rated uh, operating system uh, without a TPM. Uh, with a TPM, the benefit of that is that you have assurance that when the system comes up, it's still in that uh, trusted state. Uh, what happens there is that very early in boot, right after power on self-test, an element of unflashable BIOS measures the rest of firmware and the OS loader uh, and takes those measurements into the TPM where they are stored. Uh, subsequent to that measurement event, depending on the implementation, it's possible for code in the platform or code elsewhere in the environment to interrogate those measurements. What are they? and compare the measurements that were found at system start to a golden standard for that device. If there is variance, if they're not the same, then something can happen. Uh, an alert can be raised, the, the system can be kicked off the network, not allowed into the network, the system might halt operation, can't be trusted. What happens? Well, it depends on the person that wrote the code. Uh, this can occur at the time of boot, as happens in, a, uh, in some platforms, and it can happen when the platform applies for entry to the network uh, using TNC, or it can happen after the platform is in the network, uh, again using TNC. Bob, do you? There's a, uh, just for y'all uh, who do know something about a TPM, the, uh, first of all, <coughs> TPM in Orange Book, uh, and it, I can tell you why, are really kind of uh, 90 degrees so, uh, but, but that would take me too long. The, for those of you who are familiar with TPMs, uh, particularly the PCRs, PCR4 and PCR8 are the, which is the master boot record and the NT loader, okay, are the principal vectors for Trojans. All Trojans, all the phishing attacks you see, those are the two measurements the TPM will automatically make. And so what you want to make sure is that in your enterprise, you want to make sure that PCR4 and PCR8 are being watched, okay? Uh, just so you know, okay? Uh, those are the two key ones. Uh, you get those, you'll get rid of 99% of the Trojans out there. Okay, um, next question. Uh, yes, um, uh, this is Derek Miller, Samsung System LSI. Um, you guys have talked uh, a bit, at least, about um, ARM Trust Zone and implementing TPMs inside there. Um, and as my last reading of the TPM spec, there are hardware intrusion detection requirements which firmware can't perform. Um, is there a subset of the TPM requirements that are allowed for such systems? And then the second thought, um, uh, Trust Zone implemented TPMs, what are your thoughts on usage of in servers? I didn't catch the second part yeah. of the question. Um, yes, uh, you, got, you guys did a lot of talk about uh, trust zone implementation for TPMs in mobile platforms, and I'd like to hear your I thoughts see. about okay. servers. Thank you. Um, very large numbers of servers have TPMs built in them right now, and that have for many years. Um, uh, uh, even the servers that use virtualization, there's something called a uh, VTPM. And uh, among the major vendors of this is, uh, you know, include IBM and so forth and so on. Uh, but, but servers are, have been using TPMs for uh, many years now. Um, and I, I'll leave it at that. With regard to the, uh, with regard to the question about the TPM spec, uh, the spec states that a TPM can be implemented in software, and if it does, then it is assumed that the secure operational state of the processor that it is running in has a security envelope around it, that it does the anti-intrusion kinds of things and that sort of thing. 
So it doesn't specify what those must be. It assumes that the processor has done that, that the vendor that makes the processor has done that diligence and knows how to make it happen. In terms of running a TPM in a trust zone on a server, uh, you need to have a firmware TPM first. And it has to be something that can run in the software on environment inside trust zone. And come see me and I'll help you with that. <laughs> Frank, did you want to add anything? No, I think to, to Bob's point, right, servers have been, been discrete TPMs for, for a long time, right? You're starting to see, you know, ARM-based, uh, you know, high-density servers as well. And it's really an architecture decision whether I still want to put a discrete part down, right? I don't have space issues. I don't have right. a lot of those things that I have in a phone or a tablet or something right. like that. If I, particularly if I'm, I'm, you know, wanting a higher level of, of hardware-based security, uh, or, or if I want to do that in firmware. There's, there's nothing to preclude it. It's really a platform by platform architecture decision. Okay. Uh, next question. Alan Carp, HP Labs. A number of years ago, we programmed for the TPM, and it was so hard that we had to hire an intern to do it for us. <laughs> uh, have you done anything about the programming model? Uh, yes, actually, that's. Um, there are two levels at which you can program. If you're operating in firmware, you have to deal directly with the, uh, the TPM on a command-by-command -command basis, and that's unfortunate for you. If you're dealing at the level of the operating system, there's a middleware stack called the TPM software stack. Uh, the TPM 1.2 specification for the software stack remains complicated, but it, was a top prior it is a top priority of TPM 2.0 software stack to make that as simple and direct as possible. Any application, any business application programmer should be able to look at the TSS 2.0 API and figure out what it takes to get service from his TPM. That's the primary objective. Uh, Wang Bo Mao of Dali Cloud Company from China. Uh, two questions. Number one, uh, for a user, care about trust as an application, oh, user-only use application. I always hear a lot of boot sequence until uh, some secure OS is up, but I never heard how trust computing connects to support trustworthiness of an application. That's my first question. And second one, yeah, regardless whether it's TPM, or it's trust zone. It's some hardware. Most people, many of my Samsung mobile phone, there is no TPM. It's not trust zone. It's huge. Whereas I, I, I understand trust zone is just starting, or TPM is a different hardware, yet to be in many, many platforms. So TCG's penetration to most platforms. What is the status? Thank you. So for the second question, uh, you have an operational state in ARM processors. There are other processor types, other processor architectures that have a your operational state as, as well. Uh, Freescale is a member of the Trusted Computing Group, and they take a somewhat different approach. Uh, they are active in the group. They, they have taken principles of, of trusted boot and applied them into their mid-range and higher processors to verify the state of their firmware when they come up. They do that without a TPM. Now that means they don't have the opportunity to provide um, uh, key management services and key protection services and other things that a TPM does, but Freescale chipsets do give you a trusted boot mechanism based on TCG technology. With regard to trusted applications, if you go to TCG and you read the mobile specs, they have a concept of creating a software TPM that services a particular application. It verifies the integrity of that application when the application starts. The software TPM is what starts that application. The software TPM is started only if the hardware TPM can verify that the software TPM has not been corrupted. So the software TPM comes up, it says, I'm up, therefore I'm trustworthy. I'll check my app, and if the app is OK, I'll start it. Anybody else want to? No? Yes. Uh, hi there. AJ Shipley with Wind River Systems. 
Um, can you guys talk about a recent patent application for a trust zone based firmware TPM and what that might do to our ability to implement or broadly adopt something like that? I don't have any knowledge of that. Yeah, it's probably an area Anybody? we stay away from. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of such an application or a patent or so forth and so on. And I think that's not for us stupid technologists up here on this podium. Sorry. So yeah. <laughs> we, we're, we're, we certainly don't know enough to tell you. Yeah, so, I mean, that's something that we're going to have to navigate, right, as we look mm -hmm. to implement. So three mm -hmm. weeks ago, the patent application came out from Google. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I sit on the American Bar Association Science and Technology stuff <laughs> and so forth and so on, and, and I really think you should go consult an yeah. attorney. If we start playing IP lawyer, we'll have to bill you eight hundred dollars an hour. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I like that. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is John Perry, and uh, uh, I guess my question is: um, I, well, beginning here, um, so it seems like a lot of we have a lot of technology already today that can help prevent and lower risk for computer assets. Um, but the problem is a lot of it just isn't used or misused or is too complex. Um, so how do you guys address that with the trusted computing? And then um, also, could you talk a little bit about um, third party, like uh, embedded systems that maybe won't have the TPM chip or, or how, how we can get more vendors to integrate? Because so, it seems like they'll be like. This is the, the so, ecosystem so, question, yes. Yep. Yeah, so let me give you a little example of this, because this, is, this, is, this happens all the time. So, so right now, uh, every iPhone has hardware encryption of all user data once you set a pin, okay? So if you set a pin, the pin is, becomes a key encryption key for the encryption key that the hardware uses, okay? So this is completely proprietary, but it, it involves this notion that part of the long-term storage is open, and the other part of the long-term storage, which is user data, is you can't write or read as long as the pin is set and it's locked, okay? So it turns out the TCG Opal standard is, a, is the only industry standard that allows you to set, to, to have this sort of a notion that part of the storage is locked and the other part is unlocked, okay? And so what's happening right now is all of the competitors of Apple are sort of looking at this and saying, well, there's an industry standard now to do exactly what Apple did, and if we all do it, we'll now have a, a standardized way to provide the hardware encryption of the stuff. So, so what happens traditionally in this stuff is exactly that. The, the argument, and there's a, a great guy here from Nokia, and he gives, a, he gives a talk, he's been doing this for 10 years, his talk is the reason he wants TPMs on phones is not that we don't know how to do security on phones and do security and boot and all this other stuff. It, there becomes an industry standard way to do it. So if you write it for one phone, you could write it for the other and so forth down the line. Okay. So the way this stuff actually takes off with the industry standards is people do develop this stuff on a proprietary basis. It can be done. Okay. But then the way it begins to take off is all of a sudden you create a common way in which you can address multiple different platforms from different uh, vendors. And that's the whole key behind this. So, so the way this is, will all take off is, is uh, TCG still has the only standards, the only industry standards for uh, disk encryption, for storage encryption, and for the uh, uh, roots of trust and measurement and so forth and key, key manipulation and hardware on, on phones and, Frank, and Frank other and devices. Yeah, and, and then the other part of your infrastructure and hard to deploy was the original TCG specifications were very much where the, the, the TPM is off by default, the user has to opt in, and provisioning that was a physical presence exercise at the box, right? So one to many deployments were very painful, right, to the least. You're starting to see in Windows 8 sort of auto provisioning of the TPM. The TCG standards are, <clears throat> are, are sort of migrating now or shifting from an opt-in model to an opt-out model. And uh, the, the tier one OEMs like Dell, et cetera, we've, we've delivered management tools that allow that sort of 
hate the term, but remote physical presence, uh, <laughs> sort of the, that one-to-many management, right, of, of enabling the TPM. So yeah, there was a lot of pain initially in just that, that, that base enablement, right, and configuration, and, and I think <clears throat> most of that's uh, either been addressed already or is being addressed as the, as the new standards and, and when those new operating system levels come out. So now. Similarly in Windows, we, uh, we put in a lot of effort to make sure that the technology is easy to use. For example, BitLocker, uh, in the earlier versions, there are lots of uh, cases where user ends up in a recovery situation, right? That's, that's annoying to the user, uh, troublesome for the uh, IT admins. So we did a lot, um, lot more investment to make sure that we eliminate all the spurious recovery flow so that only if there's a legitimate reason for the user to be in uh, recovery, only then they should be in the recovery, right? So there's continued investment, continued focus on making sure that this advanced technology is in use and it's easy to use and um, easier for the end user. I think we have time for one more question and then we're, we're gonna have to end, unfortunately. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ibrahima. Um, my question is, <laughs> um, I don't know if that can be answered here actually, but if you work for a global comp organization, uh, how do you deal with US export uh, laws and uh, third party uh, countries who would not allow a device with a TPM chip into their country? Interesting question. Uh, so d just to understand how, if you're uh, working in a company outside of the U.S., maybe a country that has uh, laws against uh, you know, hardware-based uh, encryption or, or protection of data like that, how do you, what do you do? That's, that's less a, I mean, uh, Trusted Computing Group, as Brian said in his keynote, has a lot of government outreach and, and individual country forms to try to address TPM as an ISO standard, right, should right. be broadly deployed. Uh, within each of that, I think it's each hardware, you know, the, the global sort of export compliance part of every individual hardware company's, you know, infrastructure to determine for that product set, right, what can they uh, manufacture, distribute, or sell in, in the countries such as China or Russia. So you can get different like flavors in different markets depending on what the particular export laws are of those the, countries. The rules are gray, they're changing all the time, oh. right, and it's really sort of an ongoing thing that, that, that uh, as an OEM, right, we have to work with our global export folks to make sure we're, right. we're and, staying and, in compliance and, with those laws. And, and the TPM 2.0 standard was partly designed expressly to deal with these situations. Yep. And I think with that, we're going to have to wrap. But uh, I thank, uh, give a big hand to our panelists. They did a great job. And, and uh, thank you all so much. Yep.